want to invite you to open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 5. We are uh, continuing our series through Luke. And, and as we do, uh, we really, really uh, find Jesus basically following his promised statement that we talked about last week. It's right there at the end of Luke chapter 4, verse 43, that the, the town of Capernaum asks Jesus to, to stay with them, and his response to them is, is crucial. He says in Luke 4, 43, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God in other towns too, because that is why I was sent. And Jesus leaves, and so when we, we land in Luke chapter 5, we, we find Jesus in the midst of these travels that he's promised, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. And, and he arrives on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. He's preaching. Great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. Things have advanced. Now there's crowds of people following him. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now go out where it is deeper and let out your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I will let the nets down again. And this time their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat, and soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, O oh Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were others with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. A, a lot of the stories that we read in Luke are centered around this location that is highlighted today, the Sea of Galilee. Last week, I, I showed you on a map that it's sort of in the northern part of Palestine, about 40 miles north of Jerusalem. And, and in particular, we often see Jesus spending time in and around the boats of his disciples. And uh, just a few decades ago, they actually uncovered, in 1986, this boat that was dated to the first century. It's called the, the Ancient Galilee Boat, or the Jesus Boat. Uh, and it was dated to the first century Palestine. This is a, a fishing boat, much like the ones we read about in the story. It's on, a, on display in a museum in Israel. Uh, it's about 27 feet long and about 8 feet wide. So when we read stories about Jesus sleeping in the bow or, or, or uh, boats being filled to capacity with fish, this is what we see. This is a replica of that what it would have looked like uh, had it not been buried underwater for a couple millennia. Jesus, he, he climbs into the boat and he's preaching. A and Luke, in his story, identifies whose boat Jesus preaches from. He's standing in the bow of this craft. It, it says he's preaching from Simon's boat. Now, Simon, or Simon Peter is its Ray, no, most people know him as Peter. One of the things that is fascinating to think about is the fact that Luke, whose book we're reading, he's writing his book for Christians in the first century about 30 years after the events that he records. So three decades have passed. Jesus is gone. And Christians want to know what, what happened, what was it like when Jesus was on earth? You know, they're hearing stories from Paul and, and the disciples, but, but they, they weren't there. And so they, Luke 
it says at the beginning of his book, he constructs an eyewitness account. And, and today, is, as we're reading this passage, yeah, it kind of got me thinking about Ocean's Eleven. I don't know if any of you have ever seen that movie. Here's a, a poster from the movie. Ocean's Eleven, it's this story uh, of this, this gang of thieves that rob a casino. And uh, the reason for that is it's, it's kind of this classic example of an ensemble movie in Hollywood. It's, it's a movie built around all of the famous uh, stars, actors, actresses that they can pack in the movie. And Ocean's Eleven is, is a wonderful example of this ensemble genre. You know, as you watch the movie scene by scene, you know, you, you, these famous people just start cropping up on, uh, in the movie again and again. You, you get... You get George Clooney and Brad Pitt, and then all of a sudden Matt Damon's there, and then you keep watching, and Julia Roberts comes out of the woodwork. It's wild. And, and Luke, as he writes this story, he's very much assembling an ensemble piece. First century Christians, though they didn't know Ocean's Eleven, were very familiar with Jesus' Twelve. And so when Simon Peter shows up in Luke's story, the, the readers of his story are saying, oh, wow, Luke, Peter's finally here. Because they would have, some of them, probably had met Peter. Peter had probably come through their town preaching, telling the stories that they're now reading. And certainly almost all of them have heard stories of Peter kind of second-hand account. So when they get to this story, Luke is very much introducing this famous character to the, his readers. Like, oh, all right, Peter's here. And what Luke essentially does here in, in the first part of Luke chapter 5 is, is he tells Luke, Peter's testimony. This is the story of Peter's conversion. Right? We, we read here this, this confession, Oh Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. He's awestruck. This is Peter's confession of faith. This is when Peter started following Jesus. I, I, I couldn't help but wonder as I was reading the passage, you know, Luke specifically says that he's bringing together eyewitness accounts. And so one would imagine that, that Luke... At some point, probably, here's my guess, in Acts 21, it says that Luke went with Paul. Paul went with us, so he's identifying himself, us to meet with James and all the elders of the Jerusalem church were present. So I, I wonder if maybe that was the time where, where maybe Luke pulled Peter aside and asked the question I think Christians should ask each other all the time, how did you come to follow Jesus? And this is the story. This is Peter's conversion, an eyewitness account of how he wound up following Jesus. And I love this account for a number of reasons. We find Jesus runs into Simon as Simon is finishing up his day of work. You'll notice that they're cleaning the nets, and Jesus just, in the middle of them cleaning up their nets to put them away for, for the day, Jesus just steps onto their boat, and onto Simon's boat, and begins preaching. And Simon is, is kind enough to sort of facilitate that. He pulls back into the water, so he has a little bit of a platform to speak from. And after speaking, Jesus, he, he, he turns to Simon, he says, look, Go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all night and didn't catch a thing. So one of the things that maybe isn't totally apparent is that Jesus offers Simon terrible advice. Jesus, we find out, is a terrible fisherman. Because Peter, what he says, we worked all night. Well, that's because that's how fishing was done on the Sea of Galilee in first century Palestine. It wasn't a, a daytime activity, it was a nighttime activity. All night they would go out in those boats and they would fish. And, and specifically, we find Simon cleaning his nets. They used these drag nets. 
And, and what happens in the Sea of Galilee is at night, all of the fish, they go up into the shallow water right along the shore. And because they're using drag nets, they can only go so deep. The nets go down, and the goal is to catch as many fish as possible. So at night, the fish are in the shallow. There's less room for them to escape. Their nets can sort of drag along the bottom of the Sea of Galilee, and they can usually catch more fish. Jesus says to Simon, in the middle of the day, go out into the deep. So it's the wrong time, and it's the wrong place. But Simon agrees and gathers this enormous catch of fish. The, the boat was filled with fish to the verge of sinking. And, and Simon is so moved by this experience that he, he finally he, he confesses his faith in Jesus. It's, it's a simple story, but, but I, I think it's worth looking and understanding what Jesus has done in order to bring Simon, to bring Peter to this point of, of a confession of faith. For those of you who have maybe been here the last few weeks, you might remember that this is not the first time Jesus and Peter have met up. If you turn back a chapter, Luke chapter 4, you find out that Jesus travels to Peter's hometown of Capernaum, and while he's there, He's a house guest of Peter. He's staying at Peter's home. And I wonder sometimes, well, why isn't that when Peter converted? You know, we have stories in the Bible where tax collectors invite Jesus over for a meal and are converted in that moment. But Jesus is the house guest of Peter, and Peter is apparently not converted. It wasn't enough. When Jesus arrives at Peter's house in Luke chapter 4, Scripture tells us that his mother-in-law lay in bed sick with a fever, and Jesus heals her. Why isn't the healing of his mother-in-law enough to bring Peter to a confession of faith? And perhaps that says something significant about his relationship with his mother-in-law. Imagine that. Jesus, while he is staying at Peter's house, has his entire hometown come to Peter's house where they are all healed of diseases. Jesus is casting out demons, so much so that, as we read, when Jesus goes to leave Peter's house and Capernaum, the entire town is begging Jesus not to leave. Like, talk about an experience, but it wasn't enough for Peter. He's not converted. Not this intimate time with Jesus, not the, not the healing of his mother-in-law, which, you know, maybe says some things. Not, not the healing of his entire town, not seeing demons cast out. None of that was enough for Peter. Instead, what brings Peter to a confession of faith is this incredibly personal miracle that hits at, a, at precisely who Peter is. It's personal. He's a fisherman. And, and I love this, and, and I really want to emphasize this. Jesus personally reaches out to Peter. The thing that Peter does every night, the thing that he has been slaving away for his entire life, the thing he learned from his father, the way he provides for his family, even his mother-in-law, that's what brings Peter to the point of confession. And, and it's so personal that even today as we read this story, Luke does not make it clear that there is a miracle. Right? I mean, Peter responds as if there is a miracle. He is so moved. Oh, Lord, leave me. I'm such a sinful man. But really, if you read the story, it's, it's pretty, you know, Fishermen went out in a boat with their net. They put it out, and they caught fish. Not, none of the pieces of that story are especially miraculous, but in a very personal sense, they, they were miraculous for Peter. And, and I think 
Jesus demonstrates something significant in his pursuit of Peter. Jesus' pursuit of Peter is persistent. I think what we read in Luke 4 and Luke 5 is that Jesus decided he wanted Peter to be his disciple. So when he gets to Capernaum, what does he do? He stays at his home. When he stays at his home, he heals his mother-in-law. And then he heals his entire hometown. And none of those three things work. So Jesus, after traveling around for a bit, he runs into him on the Sea of Galilee, and he says, all right, I'm going to try again. And so he blesses Peter's catch of fish. Jesus is persistent. Jesus is also profitable. Now, I used profitable because it was a P, and I had a P thing going. So I just wanted to have you three Ps. But it's really blessing, right? All through the process, Jesus is blessing Peter. In his persistence, it is profitable. It was a a mark of honor for Peter and his family that Jesus, this traveling rabbi, stayed with his family rather than another one. I mean, it was, was, you know, maybe today we might think someone comes to our home and stays for a while. Boy, what a stress, what what a drag, what a drain on resources. Our culture is a little bit different. In that culture, like if someone chose to stay with you, that was a a, a mark of respect and honor. It was a blessing. He heals his mother-in-law, which I suppose, again, we could wonder whether or not that wound up being a blessing. He, he, He heals his entire hometown, which for Peter on a personal level was probably literally profitable as a fisherman selling fish to his village. And finally, he he really blesses him in a significant and profitable way when he gives him this enormous catch of fish. Jesus is persistent, he is profitable, and he is personal. He's in his home, healing the people who I suppose must matter to him in his hometown, at least. He he steps into his his place of work and blesses him there. It is this incredibly personal experience that draws Peter to this place of confession. I'm a sinful man. I think Jesus is always personal like this. I uh, was having a, a stressful day Thursday for a lot of different reasons. And so Thursday morning as I was uh, spending some time in prayer, I, I just said, you know what? I need a miracle. And so in, in my time, kind of time of prayer, I said, God, I'm going to fast until you do something miraculous, no matter what. And you know, sometimes you pray for things or you say things and you immediately regret them. And so that day as I was fasting, I, 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 the day got to, you know, about 11, and I started to think, boy, you know, a miracle would be nice. <laughs> and, and, and noon crept past, and I, boy, you know, Lord, I'm fasting. It's been almost three hours. <laughs> and I started to think, well, you know, you know, this happened. Maybe that was a miracle, and I could have some eggs. Or, you know, that, that was really, I could have a smoothie. And as I was sort of bartering with the Lord and slowly lowering my bar of what was actually miraculous, I, uh, I got a text message from my mother-in-law. Hey, your father-in-law, mother-in-law's again, really featured in this message. Anyway, your father-in-law is cancer-free. And so for those of you who know, we've been praying for what, two years for my father-in-law who's been battling cancer. And what an awesome moment. Now, for, for some of you, my, maybe, you think, well, sure, yeah, I mean, you, we've been praying for two years. He, he's been, you know, going through all the treatments. So is that a miracle? But for me, in a very personal way, for me as someone who was hungry and fasting for a miracle, <laughs> it was this really, like, it struck me in the same way that, that this, this catch of fish struck Peter. It's so personal. 
Jesus is pursuing us in this incredibly personal way. Sometimes it may not seem like a miracle to anyone but you. But that's just the way that Jesus is. He is persistent, profitable, and personal. Peter, he, he, he confesses this, this conf- he has this confession of faith in Jesus, and, and Jesus responds, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. Jesus follows the confession of Peter with this invitation. This invitation to, to, well, really, it's an odd invitation, isn't it? It's pretty fish for people. But I, I imagine for Peter, it was quite personally meaningful. But what Jesus is doing is important. Jesus, we, we, we have to recall, he has understood his purpose. We read about it in Luke chapter 4, verse 43. Jesus knows right before this, I must preach the good news, proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God in other towns too, because that is why I was sent. And when Jesus hears Peter's confession, this man that he has been pursuing, He immediately calls him into partnership with him. Jesus reveals that that when we confess our faith, he calls us into partnership with him in that moment. It's connected. The confession of faith goes directly into an invitation to this partnership, in this purpose that Jesus has to, to proclaim the good news. And this is true for us. It's valid for us. Jesus is persistently, profitably, personally pursuing us. And when we come to a confession of faith, Jesus does not leave us in that place. Why? Well, because he has to preach the good news. He has to proclaim the news elsewhere. And so what does he do when he invites us to follow him? We have to go. We, we come into partnership. The confession, we aren't left there. We, we go with Jesus from there, and Jesus is going to proclaim the good news. We wind up inexorably moving directly from confession to partnership. So how do we... When we confess, partner with Jesus, that seems like a big ask. But Jesus actually explains it really easily. You're fishing, right? That's what we're doing anyway. We're fishing. Simon Peter, he he fishes the way he knows how, and it just doesn't work. But when he fishes the way Jesus asks, the catch is something he can barely comprehend. Jesus, when we partner with him, is simply asking us to fish the way that he asks us to fish. And he demonstrates that in this story, right? Jesus, just as Jesus persistently profitably and personally fishes for us, do we fish for others? I mean, we see it all here in this story. Jesus pursues Peter. And when Peter confesses his faith, he has received this, this miracle. Jesus immediately invites him into partnership. Jesus is pursuing you. And maybe you have not yet experienced that miracle. Maybe you've experienced the miracles, but, but you, you, you didn't quite grab it. Don't worry. Jesus is after you. Simon Peter just finished his, an average day of work and Jesus showed up. Jesus will show up in your life. You don't, we don't get options on that. We can choose how to respond But Jesus is going to show up. 
And when he does, keep your eyes open for the personal way that he will bless your life. And then call you into partnership to bless others. Let's pray together. Lord, we are so grateful that we serve a God that we, we can read about and find you, Jesus. You are our pursuer. You are after us, and we are grateful that you are so ready to grab hold of us, to bless us, to have us join you. Let us each be uh, confronted by your presence in Jesus' name. Amen.